Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today for a NAC at Home program. My name is David Zyla. Uh, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, uh, the National Arts Club is a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Following the conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to write your questions in the chat area. Um, I also want to mention that uh, books will be available uh, for order and the link will be also available in the chat area. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our very special guest today, Nichelle Gaynor. Nichelle Gaynor is the author of Vintage Black Glamour and Vintage Black Glamour Gentlemen's Quarters. She has contributed to many magazines and websites, including In Style, Essence, and Glamour. She has been featured in The New York Times, The Washington Post, BBC News, The Guardian, and NPR. Without further ado, welcome, Nichelle Gaynor. Hi, David, how are you? Hello, we're so happy to have you with us. Um, and before you, you bring us into your, the fabulous world uh, of Black Glamour, um, I'm curious if you might share with us how these books happened? How did they come about? Well, they came about quite by accident initially. Uh, I was writing a novel and I was researching uh, the novel uh, at the Schomburg Center right here in Harlem. And it was searching for pictures for, you know, inspiration for certain characters that I had in mind. And I came across a picture, which I believe we have um, in the presentation, of this really pretty lady in pearls and a dress getting her hair done. And I'm thinking, she looks really familiar. And she turned out to be my aunt, my, uh, one of my great aunts, Margaret Tynes, who had a 50 year career in opera. She uh, sang with Duke Ellington. She worked with um, Harry Belafonte, with Lucino Visconti in Italy. And so, I mean, that's just, a, just touching on her career. She's one of the many early um, pioneering black opera singers out there. And so, and the woman doing her hair in the picture, who I was researching initially, her name was Rose Morgan. And she owned one of the biggest um, hair, um, um, biggest beauty salons for black women, again, right here in Harlem, called Rose Mita House of Beauty. And um, I was able actually to write a, a, a piece on her and overlook an, a long overdue obituary on her in the New York Times last year, uh, because she had a, an interesting celebrity clientele of the day, Ethel Waters, Lena Horn. Her second husband was the boxing legend Joe Lewis, whom she happened to create a fragrance um, in his honor. It was called My Man. <laughs> so these are the people, this is how this started. On, all, from all, from one photo, all from one photograph. All from one, and it just went from there, hidden in plain sight. That's how, you know, if you love history, if you love American history, and Black history is American history. A lot of it is hidden in plain sight, tucked away, not in, in, in textbooks, not on television. We're getting a bit of a moment now. Great. Let's hope it lasts. Um, it will last uh, because there's so much more out there. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Unbelievable that one photograph, you know, <laughs> opened up this world to your, to your past. Who knew? Um, as well as the stories of all of these other individuals. Yeah, uh, because I, I knew the, I, I, like, I knew the, I was researching Rose Morgan and I knew about, you know, the, the really famous ones, Lena Horn, Josephine Baker, Eartha Kitt, Dorothy Dandridge, but I didn't know some of the lesser known people. So that really, really opened my eyes to what I'd been missing, you know, and some of the people that I had seen, you know, some of these, uh, actors and artists, we may have, I am, 
You know, I grew up as a kid in the 70s and 80s. And so some of them, when they got older, they uh, appeared on sitcoms and television shows and some movies in the 70s and the 80s. So maybe I knew them um, as an older person. You know, a lot of people comment, for instance, and they're used to seeing Maya Angelou and Eartha Kid as more mature ladies. The same thing with uh, my, um, with, uh, with Josephine Baker, Lena Horne. They're not always used to seeing the younger pictures. And also Cicely Tyson, it's true for her as well. Wonderful. And, um, you know, we're going to go into your, uh, some of your photographs in just a few minutes, but I'm curious, in, in putting this book together, what would you say was the most surprising bit of research that you, you know, came across? Wow. Um, I don't know about surprising. I think a lot of it was just fascinating. I like the little tidbits that you don't hear. Um, we, I think, I think the media, you know, newspapers are better about it now. For instance, when someone dies, they may use the same old picture that you've, you've seen of a celebrity, say Alina Horn. They may have used a picture of her from stormy weather, for instance, and had the same, you know, write up the base she was at, she did one, two, three, four, five, and you know, that's it. But now, um, th there are so many little neat tidbits and facts that, I've been able to glean um, over the years from my research and putting these books together and also putting Vintage Black Glamour on social media. So I like facts that, you know, for instance, I always like to remind people that it's great. I, I'm loving all of the Black singers and actors who have their own production companies now, but you know, they were not the first to do it. You know, Harry Belafonte um, had a, a company called Harbell Productions, I believe, and one of the, um, one of the films he produced with his company was a film noir called Odds Against Tomorrow from 1959. Um, in the early 60s, he and Nat King Cole teamed together and they formed a production company. They were going to produce some projects together. But unfortunately, that was around the time that Mr. Cole uh, got sick and eventually died uh, from cancer. Um, and speaking of Nat King Cole, he and Dorothy Dan Dandridge, they once went around Hollywood pitching a sitcom with them, you know, imagine the, these two, you know, legends, they're going around saying, hey, so, you know, kind of like in a I Love Lucy kind of vibe. So we're gonna play like a husband and wife um, set of married performers and we're traveling, you know, that was one, one pitch. And the other pitch was, okay, she'll be the starstruck, he'll be a big star and she'll be his starstruck secretary, turn down all over town. Turn oh my God, her. I so want to see both of those shows. Imagine now being able to see clips of like that from YouTube, on YouTube and, Wow. You know, we, we missed out on so much because of a limited vision, to say the least. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, Nichelle, I, th I think we need to go through some of your fabulous images with you. Okay. Those are the books, um, both of my books. This, the, now, you see two versions of the women's books because there is a hardcover and a soft cover, a satin cover. And that the, the gentleman's book is also a satin cover. And for anyone who can't tell, that is Eartha Kitt on the women's book. And that is Sidney Poitier on the gentleman's cover. And that black box is the box set that will become available again um, in September. We are, um, people can pre-order now if they like at vintageblackglamourbook.com. Um, and they can pre-order, the book will be available again. And also they can either get individual books or the box set. So I was really, really happy to be able to, um, to do that and that we're able to bring it back, especially the men's book. A lot of people have been asking about the men's book. So really, really grateful to be able to bring that back. Okay. Wonderful. This is my aunt that I was talking about. This is Margaret Times. This picture was taken in September, 1959 by Carl Van Vechten. Um, there are a lot of pictures in my book um, by Carl Van Vechten. And the great thing about his work was especially in the uh, 30s and 40s. He was one of the first, um, well, maybe not the first, uh, excuse me, I'm a little sweaty here, um, <laughs> it's hot. Um, he was one of the first photographers um, to use color photos, I'd say, and, and photographing black people, in, you know, in dignified ways with, um, with color, um, color um, what do you call it, color film, Kodak. It was expensive to do it initially when color photos came out. So a lot of the great pictures that I was able to find of different artists are from that collection. So really happy. So this is, a, this is the picture that opens 
the book, the introduction is called A Diva in the Family, <laughs> which was the initial name of Vintage Black Glamour. It was not called Vintage Black Glamour. Oh, I forgot to say this, David. I was, I was initially writing a book just on my aunt. I was going to write a little a memoir on her about, wow, this initial need. I found out this, this amazing lady was related to me. You know, I found a Jet Magazine article from the 50s where she and Diane Carroll were mentioned in the same breath um, as, uh, as possibilities to star in the film version of Ann Petrie's now classic novel, The Street. Things like that. I can go on like this. You should probably keep going with the pictures. <laughs> and this is the picture I told you about that I found in the library that day. I'm looking for Rose Morgan. That's her doing my aunt's hair. And um, so I'm looking like, wow, I know she looks really familiar. And the reason I recognize her is because I, I recognized her from our family reunion booklets in the, uh, um, from the 1980s. When I, when I was a teenager, one of the family reunions we had in Smith, Smithfield, Virginia, um, we had a program. A lot of big families like mine have programs to go along with the, the family reunion. And she, a lot of her pictures were in there because she was, you know, of course, everyone's very proud of her. Um, and so I recognized her from, from that. So, and I had not met her at that point. I only, after I had done this research, and then I was able to contact her. She had just moved back to the United States at that time after living in Italy for almost 40 years. Uh, after her husband died, uh, she moved back here. And I was able to meet her again, once again in Harlem. Harlem figures a lot um, in Vintage Black Glamour. Not just, I mean, Vintage Black Glamour is global. There are Black you know, legends all over the world from the Caribbean, Africa, United States, Europe. But a lot of it, especially, it started from my um, vantage point, from people in, in um, the East Coast, Harlem, well, Midwest too, Chicago's Midwest. You know, so in, in these areas, e even if people were not from those areas, they came there to pursue their careers and everything. Lena Horan, of course, this picture was taken by Philippe Halsman. He, um, he took a lot of great pictures of a lot of um, awesome Hollywood stars. Um, and so this is one of my favorites of her. So I wanted to make sure I had a, a nice color picture of her. This is not in my book. I have other um, beautiful pictures in the book, but for today, I just felt like showing this picture. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> Lena Horan. And this is Josephine Baker, a vintage black glamour favorite. I have to say, I can post anything on Josephine Baker and say nothing and people just eat it, eat it up because she was amazing. What I like about this picture is that, you know, everyone knows what I say, all the time about Josephine Baker. Everyone knows young Josephine in the banana skirt and we love her, you know, we love young, fabulous Josephine. But in my book, I wanted to make sure that I had, you know, more mature, you know, seasoned veteran Josephine. She's about 49 years old um, in this picture. And this was one of her comeback performances um, in New York. She's wearing Dior, you know, it was just one of her, you know, at, you know, it just, again, one, you know, one of the early artists to really do that reinvention thing that we later would associate with Madonna and Lady Gaga and all that. And really, hello, Grace Jones and Elton John before that. But, you know, Josephine Baker is one of them that started it all. So I wanted to have mature Josephine in my book. So this is one of the pictures that, that I selected. We're very glad you did. <laughs> yes. Now, this, yeah, thank you. Now this lady, you know, in this moment, um, where, um, oh, let me not be too sarcastic. <laughs> I'm very happy now that so many more people who were not paying attention before um, realized that, um, that yes, Black Lives Matter. And I happened to see a meme or something today, and memes are memes, but this one kind of hit the nail on the head where it is said, you know what, we say, we say Black because all did not figure, all, you know, people forgot about the all part when all men are created equal came out, so. In this moment, I posted this photo again. This picture is in my book. This is Freddie Washington. She is an actor, activist, best known for her role in Imitation of Life, the 1930s. Now, she, at the time, she could have, you know, passed as white, as, as they say. She, would, she had been advised many times by different managers or whatever to pass as white. You can have an entirely different career if you just don't tell people you're black. And she said, no, thank you. <laughs> she on top of that, she was an activist. The band that you see on her arm, it's an anti-lynching band, protesting lynching still going on in the 1930s. I mean, 50 years before that, you had Ida B. Wells, a, um, a black champion, 
uh, one of our, um, our great um, black women champions protesting lynching. And here, Freddie Washington is 50, 60 years later doing the same, um, same thing. And here we are again, 70, 80 years later, you know, still saying, hey, Black Lives Matter. So, she, you know, she took her artistry. She did not um, compromise her integrity for a Hollywood career for anything. And she, she had a column in a Black newspaper here called Headlights and Footlights, you know. She, um, she, uh, what was, she, she was, there, there, is so, there is so much. She tried, her acting, she did a lot of, you know what she did? A lot of neat little soundies. A lot of Black performers, when they didn't get the roles in the big um, Hollywood, um, you know, the big budget Hollywood movies, there were a lot of soundies. And she did a really neat soundie I posted recently with uh, Cab Calloway. So she did a lot of neat things like that. So a really interesting, fascinating lady. She lived into, she lived to be in, in her early 90s at least. She only died in 1994 or so. Yeah. Amazing. Yep. Amazing integrity. Yeah, and speaking of integrity, this is Teresa Harris. Now Teresa Harris was an actress from Houston, Texas. And she was in a, um, you know, she made a career of playing maids um, in Hollywood films in the 40s and 50s primarily because she could not get a role as say, you know, a secretary or a nurse because they weren't casting black women in these roles. And she even told a newspaper, a black newspaper uh, uh, during an interview, you know, um, I, they say that I'm too hot. You know, if you're a, a Negro and you don't behave, I guess, in a certain way, they don't see you as a fit for a role or whatever. So that, that say, you know, she still ended up having a career a little bit later, 20, there's a Jet Magazine cover of her um, in the early 50s where she talks about the roles that she did. And I believe the next picture of, is a picture of her in the movie Babyface with Barbara Stanwyck. And in this movie, Barbara Stanwyck plays a really fun gold digger. And uh, Bar um, <laughs> Teresa Harris plays her best friend slash maid, because you know, back then your best friend is your employee. <laughs> and so she, you know, she's, but they're basically going on these adventures in New York, um, you know, Golding. So that was, you know, this was, she mentioned in that interview that I just, that I just referenced, how she rarely had a chance to wear pretty clothes in movies. She was usually in a maid's uniform or something and she did, or in like really downtrodden, whatever clothes. She didn't get a chance to, to dress up and wear different costumes, you know, and she was also a singer as well like so many of our pioneers up I mean a triple threat they were like quadruple threats and then some so really an interesting lady and a great example of some of the uh, lesser known actors and artists that I wanted to make sure I featured uh, in Vintage Black Lab. This is Dorothy Dandridge one of a, another Vintage Black Glamour favorite of course. I used this picture this picture is in the book and she is with Olga Oh, I forget her. I want to say Olga Kulnick, a, a Russian uh, dance performer. Um, she was a dance instructor who trained a lot of Hollywood actors and, you know, a lot of actors and singers, whatever. They don't just do that particular art. If you're an actor, you take dance lessons, you take voice, you train and work your instrument in other ways so you can do that. And that's what Dorothy Dandridge did. She was a really hard worker. And so this is her in a dance rehearsal uh, with Olga Kulnick. And I wanted to make sure that I put pictures in the book that were not just a pretty gown and it, doesn't she look pretty, isn't this a great dress? I wanted to show, show them at home relaxing or at work because all the, all, what we see is the end result of a lot of work like this. So that was my point in, in sharing that picture. Dorothy Dandridge at home. <laughs> this is another, this was, this picture I believe it appeared in Life Magazine in the early 50s and this was, in the wake of her success in Carmen Jones. She was nominated for an uh, Oscar, the first black actress to be nominated for a Best Actress, um, for a Best Actress Oscar. And they, this is just a beautiful shot of her at home. So I, um, there's, <laughs> that's why I included it. Ah, speaking of Harlem again. So this is Blanche Dunn. Blanche, oh, am I saying her last? I don't know why I forget. I wanna say Dunn now for whatever reason, I, I've lately been forgetting her last name in different interviews, but I certainly know her first name. She, she was what I call the, she was called like an it girl of the Harlem Renaissance. She went to parties here in Harlem, downtown in the village, um, black, white, gay, straight, everyone. She was just one of those it, um, it girls 
invited to everyone's party, to everyone's house. She knew everyone from Langston Hughes to Salvador Dali. And so again, just another, um, a lesser known person today, but she was kind of a big deal, you know, she was kind of a, uh, kind of a big deal in the 20s and the 30s, a mystery woman. You know, not a lot of information about her, but a lot of great pictures. <laughs> yeah. ah, and this is Olivet Miller. Now we know a lot of um, celebrity, um, I guess people who are, what do you call it, celebrity kids, they're like say Natalie Cole is the daughter of Nat King Cole, of course, you have a famous parent and Olivet Miller, as you can see, she played the harp. She was like a swing harpist as they built her in the 40s. She um, went to Juilliard earlier. She went to private schools. Um, she trained classically. She planned to have a career in that realm. But as jazz, you know, swing and everything became popular in the 40s, she kind of switched that up and just made a living just being this jazz um, swing harpist. And then throughout the 50, you know, for like the next 30, 40, 50 years, she's still playing the harp, but of course, just, you know, adjusting to the times. And she was the daughter of Flournoy Miller. I believe he's the next uh, picture. And Flournoy, Flournoy Miller um, was a part of Miller and Lyle. There's a, the, the first black musical on Broadway was called Shuffle Along. And th these are the men that created it. Flournoy Miller was one of them. And so he was a big star back then because it was such a big, amazing hit. Everyone knew him, and so to be Flournoy's daughter, or to be, you know, you know, you're, you were really in there. And he would later in the 1950s be a writer on the Amos and Andy television show. I'm just giving you a, the tip of the iceberg, iceberg um, with this gentleman's career. And so I, he is included um, in the men's book with his um, uh, producing partner, um, Aubrey Lyles, as well. But I just wanted to include the Millers as an example, an early example of like celebrity dad and kid kind of thing. Ah, this is Harold Jackman, Harlem again. Now, not, I, I did not include him because um, of Harlem. Now, he is very known, uh, very well known during the Harlem Renaissance because he was friends with Langston Hughes and County Cullen, people I'm really just, again, touching on the tip of the iceberg with that. Um, he was a school teacher, though. He kept his job. He hang out, hung out with all the cool people, but he was a, a teacher here in Harlem for 40 years. And what he did, which was amazing, which helps people like me today, is that he kept everything. He kept memorabilia, records, um, tickets, pictures. He collected a lot of things. So when Carl Van Becten um, began his collection at, um, at Yale, the Beinecke Library, I, I believe a lot of the early black materials from James Mullen Johnson, Langston Hughes, a lot of that was also from Harold Jackman from his collection. He was a chronicler, he kept a lot of that. So outside of being really handsome and stylish and <laughs> yet another it, you know, an it boy, and a, you know, a hot guy of the uh, Harlem Renaissance, he was an important um, keeper of, of our flame. So. This is Blanche Calloway. Uh, Blanche Calloway, now everyone knows her baby brother, Cab Calloway. And he has her to thank for his career. She's the one who asked Louis Armstrong and a couple other people to give him a shot initially. She was one of the first women band leaders. You see, she has her, the wand, you know, the uh, the wand or whatever that that women uh, that band leaders use. But she was a musician, obviously a singer. She has this great song called "Growling Dan," which has elements that people may recognize from Minnie the Moocher, Cab Calloway's big classic. Um, Later in life, she became a radio host, and she also was an entrepreneur. In the 1960s, she had um, a beauty line, like she had like a lot of, of beauty and personal care lines. So another interesting and fascinating person. This is Gladys Bentley. Gladys Bentley was a singer, um, one of the first um, um, gay LGBT icons out there. She, she was a, now this picture, I use this because that's what I could get um at the time for the book you know it's a that's a whole uh, <laughs> it's a whole thing it's it's a lot getting pictures together getting permissions and rights and all of that um but she was a masculine presenting um lesbian she wore a um like you know everyone associates the uh, the woman in a tuxedo with marlene dietrich i kind of think that gladys bentley did it first yeah, she yeah. was known for like singing a lot of her um i want to say raunchy a lot of more raunchy yes but she was a great singer 
recorded for OK, OKEH OK Records in the 20s. Um, here in Harlem, there was a club called the Clam House, which was a big um, gay club in the 20s, 30s during the Harlem Renaissance. And she was a big smash there. You could not get, um, you can barely get in the door when she sang. You know, Langston Hughes talks about her a lot. Um, in his book, I believe in his autobiography, The Big C and everything, because Langston Hughes went to go see everybody. And so he knew her and saw her, you know. So again, an, an LGBT um, icon, unfortunately, later in her career, you know, as things became more socially conservative in the 40s, in the 50s, and you know, you go out of favor, you know, women in, in entertainment, you know, they commit the crime of um, aging, you know. And so she didn't have a career as well. And she actually, she claimed that hormone treatments um, made her all of a sudden made her not gay anymore. So, which you know, unfortunate. She's trying to appeal to these people to make a living. She was on the Groucho Marx show. Well, not Groucho Marx. She was on some talk show in the early fifties. It's on YouTube, and and then I believe it was Groucho Marx and some other ones. She, she did her best to try to make a living. She eventually became an evangelist, and she died too young. I'm only about 50 years old or so in their early 50s, or, or 1960, I think, yeah. Great movie, great movie topic. Somebody can play her. I don't know. I don't know who. Um, I, well, Missy Elliott, everyone always, whenever I post Gladys Bentley, people comment how much Missy Elliott looks like her, which is true. So I don't know, maybe her, Leslie Jones. I don't know, Retta, anybody. Um, I think we would all buy me. tickets to that. What's to that? that? I think we would all buy tickets to that film. Absolutely. Yes, I want to see a, a Gladys Bentley. I, there's so many, we're so behind on films on black topics, or on, not black topics, on black subjects beyond Dr. King and, and the civil rights movement. With all due respect, we need those. We, we, you know, and we're, luckily, we're, they're being told in more nuanced ways now instead of the same old thing. Um, there's a lot more, a lot of different stories being told. So yeah, a Gladys Bentley story, a limited series. Now we have a there's a Lena Horne limited series coming up. There's a bunch of things. So, yeah. And this is, here's Lena Horne again. Now, this picture I, I included in the book, and I didn't even notice it initially because she's Lena Horne. She's, you know, looking amazing in this gown, of course. But look at the saleswomen behind her kind of shading her. Looking, you know, it's 1957, and here they are serving a Black woman. Oh, well. Let you know this. This is the type of thing that black performers, you know, black stars, you know, they had to kind of deal with. On the one hand, I think the next. The, this starts a, a fashion section. Can I see the next picture? Yeah. See this picture of Eartha Kitt also in the book. Now, you notice she and the mannequin are wearing the same gown because, and this mannequin was supposed to be in her likeness, you know, but she was a co-owner of a boutique uh, here in New York, and so this was a promotional shot. But this is just an example, uh, again, of these artists doing entrepreneurial things. Lena Horne was trying on um, clothes. I think I have a picture of, of her in the book at a fashion show at Ballet, and I think, um, with her husband. And it's, it, it was always a kind of a precarious, you know, thing to be, you know, th these designers, um, you know, in the 40s, 50s, they're only, they're not used to dealing with Black women, especially Black women of a certain station, like a Lena Horne or um, or, or or Eartha Kitt or something like that, and so it was always hard. It was it was kind of hard for them, and so starting a boutique or getting custom made clothes that was just the, the start of it. So I wanted to kind of um, delve into that a bit. With the the next picture, I think is a uh, yes. This is well, this is Lena at the fashion show um, at Belmain. She's seated in the white turban, um, and her husband um, Lenny Hayton is sitting next to her. The model, I believe, her name is Pauline. She was also a black woman. Um, so that's why I share that a lot. Um, but yeah, so it's great. I mean, this is 1960, I think, you know, so the 50s and 60s, she's, you know, looks, see, you know, she's relaxed and, and everything there, but it was also kind of a, there is a tension, you know, Sammy Davis Jr. once had, he had this great quote. He said, you know what? I have been insulted in places that most Negroes could never hope to go and get insulted, you know? So you can be in Balmain or different, there's always these microaggressions that they had to deal with all of, you know, these different issues. So the option to work with a designer, or a, um, I believe the next slide is um, Zelda Wynn Valdez. Oh no, well this, no, well, 
this is Diane Carroll, the, the now late, I still can't believe the late great Diane Carroll. She's working with Bob Mackey and his designing partner here in the 70s. They are putting the finishing touches on the gown that she wore uh, at the Oscars when she was nominated for Best Actress for Claudine. So again, I just used, now this was a, and from what I understand, this was a positive experience and this is also a little bit later. Um, but there were black designers um, like Zelda Wynn Valdez who worked with Dorothy Dandridge and uh, Ella Fitzgerald and the Lena Horns because they could, they didn't have to walk on eggshells, you know, deal, you know, they, you know, you, you, to, to, that's, I think that's the best way to put it. They didn't have to deal with as many microaggressions. Um, they didn't have to walk on eggshells. And they could also get a quality, beautiful product, obviously. Um, Maria Cole, Nat King Cole's wife, wore um, an original Zelda Wind Valdez gown, Zelda Wind gown, uh, when she married Nat King Cole. So, see the next picture? Oh, I, I forgot that I stuck all these pictures in here. This is a great shot that I found in um, Ebony, I'm not Ebony, in Jet Magazine in one of their week's best photos, I think, uh, sometime in the late 50s. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I included this picture because it's just a, another example of just some of the neat little things that you find that is not really well known, even though there's a lot of really well known people in this photo. Um, it, the, in front is Nat King Cole. Behind him um, is Billy Eckstein. Um, Harry Belafonte is at the end, and right in front of Howard, Harry Belafonte is Sugar Ray Robinson, the uh, boxing champion. And they were at a fashion show at Nat King Cole's house. And so he decided he hosted a fashion show. Those ladies, um, they were guests. I'm not sure. I don't think they were named in the caption, but just an example again of you know, show you know showcasing black designers and, and models and a place for black people to feel comfortable socially and to, and to buy some clothes. And so I thought that was a neat, um, uh, I thought that was a neat picture. I could not get a, a clear photo of that for the men's book, but yep, uh, I like that. Here is it, the lady I've been talking about, Zelda Wynn. She is adjusting a gown on um, uh, Dorothy Dandridge here. And she also, you know, later in life, she would design costumes for um, Dance Theater of Harlem, the, the classic dance company. And she also had a hand. Now, I have heard that she did it herself and some are just saying she only had a hand uh, in designing the Playboy Bunny costume. She definitely at least touched on it. Uh, but before that, she was doing custom gowns for the, the black elite, like, you know, like these stars, Dorothy Dandridge and um, um, Maria Cole, as I mentioned. Um, Ella Fitzgerald uh, was also a client and she would have to look at papers, newspapers, and see if, if Miss Fitzgerald had gained or lost any weight to kind of adjust the measurements if possible, because she would just call on the phone and say, I need three gowns. And she would just need to have the three gowns ready. So she just did, you know, you couldn't get on FaceTime and see how you were doing and, you know, get, get information fast enough. So she did, you know, that was how she worked. And so um, I didn't, I did not have a picture of her in the book, but I have shared her quite a bit on social media. Here is mid now this, this picture I could have shared in the book, but I wasn't sure. I'm 99% sure that this is still Miss, um, Miss Wynn, Zelda Wynn. And this is Eartha Kitt that she's uh, fixing, um, she is, you know, she's working with her on this dress. Gordon Parks took this picture, the great um, photographer. Um, it was in Life Magazine and she was not identified. You see the tape measure around her neck because a lot of the black, you know, designers like Miss Wynn, you know, um, going back to Elizabeth Keckley, you know, Mary Todd Lincoln's um, designer, they, they thought of these black women as seamstresses. They did seamstresses. They did not give them the designer moniker. They didn't think of them as that way. Like Ann Lowe, who designed Jackie Kennedy's wedding gown. She wasn't even named in it. Now that, that would be, that's an entire career. You designed for Michelle Obama and you, you have an entire career. You know, in the fifties, they were like a Negro seamstress made the dress. So this is what, this is why the information is not known about these people because they weren't giving proper credit at the time. So that's why I include people like her in there. Now, Diana Ross, this is, Di you know, everyone knows Diana Ross, of course, right? I include this, did I use, no, I use a different picture in the book. This picture is from Mahogany. Of course, I'd want to recognize this, um, this photo, but I included her in this section of talking about dealing with 
designers in fashion because Diana Ross came at a point where as a star, she can say, you know what? I don't like that gown. I want to design it myself. This is what's going to happen here. And so she designed some, not all, but some of the um, costumes for um, Mahogany. I believe Valentino designed what she's wearing here. But some of the more outre outfits um, in, in, in uh, Mahogany were designed by Miss Ross herself. She, um, I believe she even had an ambitions to have an a entire a fashion line, but she was one of the first stars to kind of push to do something beyond what people thought she could do or what they felt they wanted her to do. Like, you know, that whole shut up and sing thing. No, I'm, I'm a singer, I'm an actor, I'm gonna design the gown, I'm gonna do all of the things that we're used to celebrities doing now. She was really the, um, the first to push on it, push for that on a bigger level, uh, I would say. So that's why I included her outside of her being, of course, the amazing Diana Ross. <laughs> Ah, and so this lady is the reason that I became a writer in the first place. This is Dr. Maya Angelou. And I mentioned earlier how sometimes people are used to seeing certain legends um, when they're much older. And most people were used to uh, seeing uh, Maya Angelou like this. Well, in this picture, she's kind of backstage relaxing before she um, went on stage. I believe, I want to say the Village Vanguard. I'm kind of forgetting now. But this is in the 50s. And at that time, she was a Calypso singer. She was a Renaissance woman. She had many careers. <laughs> and so at this point, she was a singer. There's some great video footage of her um, singing. Um, look for Run Joe, if you can find her singing that. But I wanted to include this picture of her, you know, in her singer dancer mode, relaxing, you know, picture, you know, that you're not used to seeing Dr. Angelou. So this is Jeffrey Holder, the amazing, talk about a Renaissance man. This picture appeared in Ebony Magazine in October of 1975. And speaking of at home, <laughs> he was at home um, and he's surrounded by his paintings. He painted all of that work that you see around. He could, you know, sing, dance, act, paint. He designed outfits. I'm sure he designed what he's wearing. Um, his uh, wife, Carmen Galagalot, who's still um, with us, Mr. Holder died um, a few years ago, but um, about five or six years ago, but. Uh, Mr. Lavalot is still with us, and he designed a lot of uh, her gowns. He uh, did a lot of paint. Um, he painted what you see. He did a really nice painting of Lena Horn from 1959. Really interesting uh, gentleman, beyond what people tend to know him for, you know, from as Baron Samadhi in the James Bond films in the 70s or the Seven Up commercials in the 80s, which I my first exposure to him. Um, and also, and yes, we can't forget Boomerang. You know, he was in Boomerang with Eddie Murphy. Thank goodness for Eddie Murphy putting so many legends in that movie. Jeffrey Holder, Eartha Kitt, Grace Jones, Mario Van Peebles. He packed that movie with legends, so yes. And yes, Trin I saw a flash. Mr. Holder was definitely from Trinidad, absolutely. <laughs> and here is another Trinidadian. This is Hazel Scott. She was born in um, Trinidad as well. Um, she was, now some people may know her as the um, wife of, um, Adam Clayton Powell, a famous Harlem congressman in the 40s and minister. But she, you know, she's at the piano here. She was a, um, an amazing classical pianist who, of course, did a lot. I mentioned Olivette Miller earlier doing swing um, harp. On that piano, she's doing that, you know, she could do the swing. There's a great clip I just posted now that you can post longer videos on Instagram. Uh, there is a movie uh, called I Do It. It's the name from 1943, and she and Lena Horne are appear in this clip um, with this song called Jericho, and it's an amazing, you can see her, just a taste. There's so many, there's quite a bit of um, ha Hazel Scott uh, playing the piano on YouTube. And in this picture, this happens to be a photo from a dinner honoring a, um, a gentleman who was like um, one of the first black captains in the Navy to lead an integrated crew during World War II or something. The gentleman behind her, um, directly behind her, leaning in his hand, that's Paul Robeson. So at this dinner, they were, you know, people like that were there to honor um, this gentleman. I believe his name was Captain Hugh Malzak. So this is, you know, that, that um, I wanted to make sure that I included that picture in the book. Oh, and a fun fact with her, um, it said that she had her hands insured by uh, Lloyd's of London <laughs> for like a million dollars. <laughs> so. One of my favorites. Ah, now Hazel Scott, she, outside of what I just told you about her, 
she also, you know, when her friend um, died, she wanted to make sure that people saw beyond the, what the, what the news report said about her or the stereotypes and wanted to know that there was a person, a full-blooded a human being um, beyond, <clears throat> beyond that. This is Billie Holiday. She's skiing in Switzerland. And I wanted to, um, this is a picture I've shared quite a bit on social media, but I, did, I was not able to include it in the book. This appeared in Jet Magazine. Um, but I wanted to show this picture because people are so used to Billie Holiday being sad and downtrodden and, and drug addiction. And, and yes, that was a part of her life, but she was a whole human being who lived, you know, she loved her dogs. I always, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I post pictures of her um, cooking a steak for her, <clears throat> excuse me, talking so fast. I post pictures all the time of her making steak um, for her dog, Mister. Um, and this picture of her skiing, no one thinks of Billie Holiday skiing in Switzerland, having, you know, having fun, relaxing. They think of her as, as sad and on drums. And I want people, just like I want the people to look at Dorothy Dandridge beyond being pretty and sad, I want them to see the hard worker that she was. And, and remember that she and that King Cole went around pitching that show in Hollywood and try to do different things, you know, break out of the box of think of Eartha Kitt beyond Catwoman, think of Josephine Baker beyond the banana skirt. So that's why I included that, um, this picture after Hazel Scott. And I, I believe the next one is probably the last one. I'm not, I'm not is it a lot? Yes. This is the picture that I included in my book um, of Ms. Holiday, taken by Carl Van Vechten again. Um, this is around 1949, this picture was taken. So that's 70 years ago. This is a 70 year old picture. And, you know, again, there, he took black and white shots that day and color. And he talked about, um, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Farrah Jasmine Griffin, she is a pro professor at Columbia. She wrote a book called, If You Can't Be Free, Be a Mystery, about Billie Holiday, about Billie Holiday's life beyond what, you know, what people know about Billie Holiday. And so I wanted that, what I do in Vintage Black Glamour is include things like that. And just instead of a standard picture of her at a microphone singing, I want you to see the person Billie Holiday and, and think about the person and the artist beyond what you may have known or, or think you know. So that, that's it. These, this is an amazing collection of photos and uh, thank you for these snapshots into thank these you. lives. Um, I'm curious if you might identify a few of your subjects and maybe give us some specific reasons why you feel that they and their singular style um, has left such a, a, a huge impact. Well, do you mean like some, for some of the more famous ones or? Uh... It doesn't, it doesn't have to be. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm wondering like, are there a few subjects that you, that you cover here that you really feel that there's, you know, a specific reason why they clicked in the way that they did and why we, you know, remember them and love them and, you know, and maybe even emulate them. Well, I think a great example of that would be Josephine Baker again. Now, Josephine Baker, everyone, had, um, like I said, beyond the banana skirt, you know, with the advent of social media, not just me, a lot of people have shared a lot of amazing rare photos of her. Um, there, there's a set of photos that I share of her where she's getting a pedicure. You know, she's getting a manicure, a pedicure, um, I share clips from some of the films that she did in France. Um, excuse me. You know, in the 20s, she was still getting movie offers to play a maid <laughs> in the 30s. She was a big star, a superstar in Europe. And the Hollywood offer was to, you know, play a singer who just happened to be a maid, you know, or that kind of thing. And it's not, you know, it, it, it varies. I mean, Billie Holiday did that. Um, she did, there's a clip from, I want to say it was a Spanish language movie. I don't know, but she and I want to say Louis Armstrong are in this movie, and she sings in the movie. But the, the acting part where she's playing, she is, she is, um, she's playing a maid. And there's nothing wrong with a maid. My uh, my late paternal grandmother was a maid. She used to go out and do day work, as they say, with her friend. Uh, so there is there is dignity and and honor with maids. With with there is no dignity and honor. Is it just limiting us to one? 
um, you know, to one snapshot of who we are as people. So it's not about, you know, not, uh, uh, it's not about putting maids down, I'm just saying. Just using that as an example because that is the thing that people know most. So Josephine Baker in Europe, she's playing, now granted there weren't, I mean, there were some problematic things here and there, but for the 20s and the 30s, I think she did the best she could. She's playing these roles in movies. She's also, you know, she's, she had a pet cheetah. I just posted a picture of her with her pet cheetah the other day. <laughs> Chiquita, it looks like a picture, I, I, I use the analogy of strength, the strength card from tarot decks where she's kind of, you know, taming this cheetah, you know, there and, and the pictures that I show of her is a more mature woman. Um, just the evolution of her career, the things that, the pictures that she took, the, the chances that she took, people, it resonates because we still resonate with that today. People are still doing the same thing. People still get fresh inspiration you know, some of her pictures look like they could have been taken yesterday, even though you know it's an 80 year old picture. So someone inspirational and vibrant like that, that's why they resonate. That's why an Eartha Kit resonates, you know, beyond that. Because of course people got to know an older Eartha Kit singing at the Carlisle and Boomerang and, and everything and on Broadway. Um, that's where, you know, she's one of the few legends that I had a chance, the, uh, the honor to meet. But yeah, so, Yes, I, 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 I hope that answers the question. <laughs> that, that answers it beautifully. Uh, I'm curious, is there an individual that maybe came on your radar after the books were published and you said, oh gosh, I've got to do another edition. I just discovered this other person. No, what happened is I could not fit everyone that I wanted to in the first book. Uh, uh, there, there are so many. When you go to the printer and you say, okay, we're going to do a 200-page book and here are the pictures and there's a lot of mechanics that come to, you know, to putting a book together. So in, in a lot of cases, like in the first book, I talk about Grace Jones, I talk about Shaka Khan, but their picture isn't there because we weren't able to get the right picture in time, the picture that I want to fit. You know, in the men's book, I didn't have the picture that I wanted a Prince. But, you know, there is a picture of Prince in the book, but just as an example, there's so many, there, I mean, there are some people that I, I, I came across later, um, but more, it's more so, I can't, I can't fit everybody in. I'm doing a third book now, it's, you know, um, it's been a while, I've been doing this book for a while because I wanna make sure it's not like the first book. Um, the first book is women, the second book is men, and the third book is gonna be men and women, and it's gonna be more colorful, funkier, a little more, you know, psychedelic, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. We're going to stop in the maybe early 90s because I think I want to stick in Vogue in there. You know, we're definitely going to have Whitney and Sade. I did not put Whitney and Sade in the first book. I almost put Whitney Houston, that's Whitney, uh, Whitney Houston. I almost put Whitney Houston in the first book because by that time she had already passed. Um, but I, you know, I, she was still too, she came out in the 80s and I really end the first book in the 80s because I start in the late, um, late 19th century and I want and that's already 80 years and I'm just packing as much as possible um, with known and unknown people so like I said it's more of a problem of I can't fit everybody in there there's more than enough to, to fit in my books there's more than an, enough uh, to do um, television and streaming projects I've been working you know looking forward to doing something in that area um, as well I'm doing scripted things as well but as far as vintage black glamour hope, hopefully we will we, um, we'll be going in that area, I'll, I'll say, television and streaming. So there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of stories to tell. There's so much there, and there's enough to tell whereas you don't have to overlap. There's no need to have five movies on the same person. <laughs> I'll just say, yes. We'll just go to the ones that you write. Please do. Just your version. That's just my book, yes. <laughs> That's my books and my movies Only and, your and books. docu-series and all of them. Thrilled to hear there's going to be another a book from you. Um, we have a few questions from our fabulous audience. And Cam writes, how did you go about getting the permission and rights for the photos? Well, that's a fun, my pu publisher goes about doing that. Usually you, you, I gather the information of where I got the photos and you go to the rights holder. And in many instances, it, it is a photo agency, like say a Getty or something. It could be an institution like Yale that I mentioned earlier. Um, or it could be the estate of the photographer. These are 80, 90, you know, year old pictures, you know, 
50 year old pictures quite often the photographer is deceased so it, it, it you know it really it, it varies your the permissions um, that's the publisher's um, aspect of that and you have to organize that so you can get the rights to it you get permission you pay any fees it's not free to put pictures in these books because every now and then people say oh you know they wonder why it, it's, it's not free to, to put this book together <laughs> so. um, we have a couple of other great questions um, we have a question is there someone from your research that you personally felt a great similar connection with? Well, you obviously mentioned your aunt earlier, but I think they're asking beyond that. I think it depends on the day. I mean, quite often it's usually the writers. I mean, I have a section in the book where I have writers. I have Maya Angelou, Lauren, Lorraine Hansberry, and Zora Neale Hurston. You know, again, I've, I've mentioned Harlem several times. Zora Neale Hurston, of course, is, was here in Harlem. She, you know, in the Harlem Renaissance and, and dealing with, um, you know, just dealing as a writer living, you know, sometimes that bohemian poverty and then sometimes that beneath bohemian wealth as a writer getting, you know, a lot of things in her story I, I recognize and related to as a writer. The same thing with um, Maya Angelou um, as well. So yeah, usually, usually the writers, the, the, act the actresses, I tended, like I have Rosalind Cash in my book. Rosalind Cash is not someone that's always, people are gonna think of automatically as glamorous. She was a brilliant actress, they'd recognize her as that. She's an actress that should have been Oscar, should have had Oscar worthy roles. She was an Oscar worthy actress that didn't have roles that, that didn't even touch the level of her skill. And so I grew up looking at her just being mesmerized, mesmerized and wanting to see more. Uh, so, that's why I included her in the book. I have Pam Greer in the book, who I love. Um, I, I have, now Tamara Dobson's another um, example. She played Cleopatra Jones, couldn't get that picture uh, as well. So she'll be in the third book with Ray Jones and Shaka Khan. But Rosalind Cash opens the book um, where I talk about, the, the section where I talk about actresses and, and all that. So I just wanna include people like that that you won't always see. Um, and I have a picture of Phyllis Hyman the late great singer getting her makeup done in the book. And so I include women like that, that reminded me of myself or women that I know, women in my family, like a favorite aunt type of person, you know, that my book is bookended by aunts. My opera singing aunt who inspired the book, as I told you, and my aunt who modeled um, in the 50s, who did some local modeling. And there's a picture that at the, at the end of her, a lot of people who are familiar with Vintage Black Glamour before familiar with my aunt Mildred Taylor. I've, I've spoken of her and she went, she goes viral every couple of years. She got married a few years ago and she wore this beautiful gown and this beautiful purple gown. A lot of people recognize her from that. So um, yeah, and so that, that you know, I reckon I, when, I, I, when I see myself, that representation, what people are talking about today, representation matters. Does it matter? Do you always need to see someone that looks like you? No, but quite often it would, it would be nice. It would be nice. I grew up what, looking at Charlie's Angels as a kid and none of them were black, but I still liked watching Charlie's Angels, sure. But the, it's just a matter of more variety and just getting out and, and, and seeing a reflection of yourself, so. We have a question from Claire um, who would like to know how, dif how difficult was the choice for the front cover with so many incredible options? You know, it, it was just a matter of, it was difficult. It, it was difficult in, in that which legend to put on the cover. There was a lot of great pictures and yes, you have to whittle it down. And at first I had, there was a picture that I had for a long time, I thought Dorothy Dandridge would be on the cover. I had a picture of her that ended up for aesthetic reasons, um, it, it didn't um, work out. So I wanted something that would obviously be eye-catching, um, that would catch your eye and but but it i mean it wasn't too hard i mean it was just kind of like when when my publisher presented that particular out of all the pictures i presented and then my publisher they happened to be one of the ones they found so when i saw that eartha kit picture i'm like oh yeah yes yes that that will work the, the gentleman's picture with Sidney poitier that's actually a picture of him from the movie that he wrote and produced called for love of ivy he starred in it with Abby Lincoln, a great singer and actress. He wrote that script, he said, um, so his daughters can see a representation of natural, of, you know, of, of, of a black woman um, on, on the screen. And so the Hollywood 
you know, machinations of the day, whatever. This is 1966, 67, that movie comes out. And this picture of him in a tuxedo is from that. The men's book is, is, was a little harder. Again, getting something aesthetically and go along with it. The third book is going to be a little different aesthetically, but it's just a matter of, you know, I guess that's a marketing angle and, and all that because you can love someone's picture in theory, but and also the, with the women's book um, and the men's book, there's a satin cover. So some of the pictures don't translate well on that fabric. And so uh -huh. sometimes that was, you know, that's all. And I'm glad the men's book is coming back as well. Um, so people can see, can see that. Such, they're so beautiful. Um, curious, um, if we were to fast forward to 2040, who are the three individuals that you would say, oh, they've got to be included, like hands down? People ask me this all the time. And I've started to think about it more only because people ask me because it just doesn't occur to me like that. I mean, <laughs> society changes, their tastes change. And, and now what I'll say now is as far as the different artists, there's so many more now. Like in, in you know, 50, 60 years ago, you had to be the one. You can have Lena Horne. And then, okay, now Lena Horne, you know, tons of, of black women didn't get a chance because Lena Horne was the, the sole person that, that they chose to promote and put out there and there were limited media options, whatever. Now you can be a star without getting mainstream co-sign. You'll be a star and mainstream will come out after you. I'll give you a, a brief example of that. When Selena, the, the Mexican American singer, when she um, died initially, I remember being in a subway and watching people cry and reading the newspaper. And I'm like, my God, who was, who was she? Now that wouldn't happen. Everyone would know you can across cultures, whatever. Everyone knows, was it the, the, the Korean boy group with um, BB, B, I'm gonna mess up their names, I forget. But every, the, everyone knows the, um, these bands or these actresses or whatever. You don't have to be an American or a European for the whole world to know you now. And so when Selena died and there were so many, the mainstream was like, wait a minute, who is this? Why is there such a tsunami of people mourning this woman? And that's when the world got to know her and the movie came out and, and all of that. And so that, you know, that's what, hap that's, that's what tends to happen with, with us. Now, you know, if, if, if I'm looking 40 or 50 years ahead, I have no idea because it, de it depends on the taste. I mean, I would say my, my standard answers tend to be Beyonce, um, maybe Kerry Washington, I'll say Oprah, because just like I include, um, I have Alelia Bundles. I mean, Alelia Bundles is my friend. Alelia Walker, Madam CJ Walker's daughter. I have a picture of her in her Harlem home. Um, about 10 blocks from here in the book. And so she was not a, you know, the, what, it, what they call the, you know, the glamorous type or whatever, but she was a fab, you know, she was a party. She, she, she threw parties, she traveled the world. She was very wealthy, interesting woman included in, in the book. So it was not necessarily a matter of who was a star at the time or who was doing, you know, it, it's not a typical usual suspects thing. It depends on the taste. There are people now, there are um, singers and, you know, I like Jill Scott and Erica Badu. Maybe someone else is going to prefer, uh, you know, other, you know, a, a younger, the younger generation now, the younger generation. So when you talk about 40, 50 years from now, it depends on, it's not going to be something, vintage Black Glamour in that sense would be too limiting because there's too many more people now. There's too many more, you know, you have all kinds of, um, you know, you can just do a music. It's, it's just too, it's, it, the box is too small. It's, it's, you know, it's too small. But I, I say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I went, on, went off on a tangent, surprise. <laughs> um, I was talking about um, um, Elilia, B Elilia Bundles is my friend. Elilia Bundles wrote this book called On Her Own Ground, which is a definitive biography of Madam C.J. Walker. Everyone knows there was a Netflix movie um, that was, um, just came on. My friend Nicole happened to write that, so friends on either side of that. Octavia Spencer was brilliant. I understand she was nominated for an Emmy for that. I think I just read that. So, um, but I say that to say that, yes, I would include Oprah um, in that. Oprah is not what everyone, you know, Oprah is Oprah, you know, she is Oprah, but she is not a typical glamorous, isn't that a pretty gown, isn't this a pretty dress? So it's never about that. It's about style and substance. So when Oprah, uh, Carrie Washington, who is an actor, producer, she does different things. Um, 
it, it, Beyonce, of course, a, a global uh, superstar like Beyonce, everyone, that picture I showed earlier of Dorothy Dandridge working hard and everyone talks about how Beyonce works so hard and she does this, that, and the other. Beyonce comes from a heritage of that. So there, you know, 40, 50 years from now, I would say, I'm sure Beyonce would be in there. I'm sure Oprah would, and it depends on who's doing it and what their taste is and what they're, you know, what they're looking to share with the world with that. Yeah. I, I th saying style and substance just literally sums up every subject in your books, doesn't it? Um, yes, that, that's my aim. Thank you. That's exactly what I'm going for. Um, it's, I, I want people to say, I mean, yes, I, I can't get enough of a beautiful gown. I can't get enough of, you know, of Josephine Baker getting a pedicure and a manicure, of Josephine Baker having a cocktail in Venice, you know, this is water. By the way, people, but, but just, you know, I have a great picture in the book of her, um, of Josephine Baker, like at the end of the day, having a cocktail or something. And there's another great picture of Lena Horne and Hazel Scott having a glass of champagne together, stuff like that, where they're relaxing too. So yes, I want to show the, the, the I hate the, well, humanity is a good word. Our humanity for, you know, our, our humanity, our artistry, you know, the ups and downs, not just the downs, but the ups and downs, the successes, the, the steps it took to, to, to get there. So I wanted to give, a, as, best, as best as I could, I wanted to give a well-rounded view of these people. And, and, uh, be, uh, and so people can understand that artists are not just, I mean, some artists are indeed magical, some are indeed unicorns, but quite often artists are people. <laughs> artists are just hardworking people doing the best they can, you know, at the book, you know, at the desk slaving away at a book or a script or an actor trying to remember their lines or whatever actors do to, you know, prepare for a role, a singer you know, preparing her voice, a dancer taking care of her body, you know, artists are, you know, artists are people. And so I just kind of, that's kind of like, a, that's one of my ends there to kind of show the variety of artists as well. So amazing. Um, so I have one final question. As someone who clearly has followed their passion, what advice would you give to someone who is looking to make a career out of their own special interests? I would say that just, you know, be clear on, on what you want to do, but don't limit yourself. I mean, you may follow one path and say, you know what, maybe that's not for me. Initially, when I started, I was writing a novel. Um, and of course, that project is now a, a, a script, a pilot, because, you know, as you do. So <laughs> I, you start out in, on one way and, you know, on one lane, and then you end up on another. So just begin. Just start. Just do it. If you have an idea, sketch it out, write it, figure it out, research it. Look at who's done it before you read books on it. Look at movies. Now, if you want to be a singer, if you want to be an actress or a writer, I mean, YouTube is your friend. Google is your friend. You can, you can find so, many, um, so much information on how to do something. You can publish your own book or not. Or you can, you know, there is so much information out there. Now, in a way, that can be a little dangerous. Sometimes you can kind of maybe rush into something and not be prepared. So there's enough information out there where you can prepare yourself as much as possible you know, study it, check it out, see what you want to do, be clear on what you want to do, and just just go for it, just do it. And don't worry about what people are going to say. People always have something to say, especially people who don't actually do anything, so. <laughs> <laughs> Nichelle, we cannot thank you enough. You are clearly an inspiration, and thank you for sharing the style and substance of all of these incredible individuals. Um, if you are interested in Nichelle's books, uh, there is, we, you can uh, go to her website to purchase them. Uh, and on behalf of the National Arts Club, I want to thank you, Nichelle Gaynor, and I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.